Oh, you guys, today's episode is so good. My guest is Brad Kearns. This is his second time on the show. I had to have Brad back on after I saw a Facebook post that just got me all lit up because Brad is very well known in the ancestral primal community, um, the keto community, fasting, all these things. And he was talking about how he's eating fruit for breakfast now, and he's eating more carbs and he's eating more food and he's feeling better. He's recovering better. His energy levels are up all of it. And I was like, Brad, please come back on the show and talk about it. So he agreed. And I'm so excited to bring this to you. So if you don't know about Brad Kearns, he's, he's a little bit of a legend in the nutrition world. So you should know Brad Kearns. Um, he's a New York times bestselling author. He's a Guinness world record holding, um, professional speed golfer and a former former national champion and number three world ranked professional triathlete. So that's where Brad comes from the athletic world, you know, pro athlete, and then came over into the nutrition world and education and man, he on everything on peak performance, diet, health, ancestral living. He's a very popular speaker, retreat host. Um, and he's, you know, done a lot of things with Mark Sisson. If you know Mark Sisson, they kind of go hand in hand, a little duo. So um, in 2017, they had a New York Times bestseller called the Keto Reset Diet um, and just so much more. There's, It's hard to list off all of Brad's stuff because he's just been around and been doing so many huge things in the industry. Um, he also has a podcast called the B Rad Podcast. So it's the letter B dot Rad Podcast. You'll see on this episode, Brad is super informative, very fun to listen to. I highly recommend and listening to his podcast as well. If you like mine, cause he's just, he's got so much good information. And it's just a fun time. Always listen to Brad. So check that out. Um, you can find anything you want to find from Brad, what he has to offer at bradkearns.com and make sure you follow him on Instagram. It's at Brad Kearns one and Kearns is K E A R N S. All right. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about diet variation, getting into uh, being able to change your paradigm about nutrition, trying new things, what he's you know learning in this journey. This is so information packed, so much wisdom, and just the coolest mindset ever. Love this episode. Here is Brad Kearns. Before we get in the show, I wanted to make sure that you guys knew about two awesome things that I have going on right now in my company. The first is my next hire retreat, which is going to be in Maui, Hawaii. This is May 10th through 14th. Please check it out at taragarrison.com slash retreat, and it will redirect you to that page. This is going to be focused all on physical health. So my retreats from now on will be focused on one of our four peaks of hire, which are personal, physical, professional, and people, which are like the four key areas of life that we focus on. And this retreat is all focused on physical. So we're doing a biohacking buffet, a biomechanics class, the mindsets behind physical transformation you might be missing. We're also doing health the way I feel like it should be done. And that is having fun, playing outside, hanging out with cool people. We're going to be surfing, spending some time at the beach, hula dancing, so many amazing things. So if you want to check that out again, it's taragarrison.com slash retreats. And, um, the other thing is a new coaching offer that I have. I'm very excited about this. This is my path to being able to help more people. And so I have offered a group coaching form of higher coaching. What that involves is a private coaching community, a group coaching call with me once a week. And you also get access to my coach Tara app included in this and access to every single program that I have ever released all in a vault for my higher coaching clients. So very excited about that. It is only $297 a month. So significantly discounted from my private coaching. So if that's interesting to you, please check it out at taragarrison.com. You'll just see it right there on my homepage, or you can go directly to the taragarrison.com slash higher dash coaching. All right, let's go ahead and get into the show. All right, Brad Kearns back in the house. If you guys aren't watching on YouTube, Brad is glowing. You're glowing, Brad. I got some lighting. I got my yes. new high-tech contraption that uh, uses the phone for the camera instead of the computer. So hopefully I'm a little sharper. Yeah, I'm trying. I, need, I need whatever you got. Let's talk about what you got because my audience knows if they haven't heard your episode before or they're unfamiliar because they live under a rock, you know, we know that you've been involved in the keto world, talking about keto, talking about metabolic flexibility. You know, you have this no-nonsense approach uh, in terms of longevity, sustainability, um, what optimizing truly, you know, and as an athlete and, you know, and someone who's now helping other people get healthy, I really appreciate that mindset. And I opened up Facebook and I'm not a big Facebooker, I admit, but I opened up Facebook and I saw this post from you and I'm going to read it for everybody. And then we'll dive in. I was like, 
Yeah. <laughs> so this is what Brad wrote, you guys. He said, I'm months into my experiment to consume more carbs, more total calories, and cease with fasting in favor of eating a huge bowl of fruit and a huge protein smoothie every morning. Oh my gosh, Brad. <laughs> Listen to my two interviews with you know a couple other podcasts that he talked about, um, episodes on energy balance reflections, my extra calories, and he said similar training and lifestyle patterns have resulted in improved body composition, improved fitness, better workout recovery, and resolution of nagging injuries. Somehow I didn't add body fat and I'm still vain. I mean, vain with the E. <laughs> I'm sold on the idea of eat more, move more in pursuit of longevity and peak performance. Note, I'm talking about eating nutritious foods only. And in fact, my indulgences have minimized because I eat so much good food. I can tend that my nutrient nutrient dense, fully fueled diet prompts a more active, energetic day. And so that is what I want to talk about today is this eat more, move more. I mean, you're eating fruit in the morning. That is like, people are going to fall off their chairs right now. So let's talk about it. What prompted this experiment? Just you being you? Well, it seems like there's a groundswell uh, of momentum building with a lot of experts who are rethinking the proper application of what we really should call tools like eating in a ketogenic pattern, like fasting, skipping meals, time-restricted feeding, um, and the tools and strategies, right? Instead of a lifelong adherence to staying below 50 grams of carbs per day. Now you can hear people talking freely that uh, this was never the intended purpose of uh, these types of strategies. And so my recalibration is especially based on my athletic interests and my desire for longevity and health span. So it's now clear that the the you know the, the key to living a long, healthy, active, happy life and protecting from the disease and demise that we see all around us is to maintain fitness and muscle mass and muscle strength throughout life. And so whatever it takes to uh, be a strong, active, healthy person, that's going to be the winning formula. Now we have to kind of uh, cross-reference over to all the popular diets of the day and uh, come up with this realization that really hit me well when Jay Feldman said this on a podcast. He's the host of the Energy Balance podcast. And he said something like, let's face it, fasting, keto, low-carb, time-restricted feeding, these turn on stress hormones in the body. And that is in fact the mechanism by which the benefits are realized. So these are stressors to the body and they prompt an adaptive response. Uh, with ketones, we know keto, we know that you restrict your carbs or you do a lot of fasting, you're going to start making ketones and they have wonderful properties. They burn cleanly for fuel in the brain and uh, they have anti-inflammatory immune benefit. Same with fasting, right? It's the most optimal human state for cell repair, anti-inflammatory, uh, all those wonderful things. Um, however, we have to remember that these are stress mechanisms. And then we reflect on life as a whole, which today is chronically stressful like no other time in history. We, are, we all live somewhat stressful lives a lot of times for the wrong reasons, the stress of carrying around the device in your pocket and getting hit with EMFs or arguing with your uh, family, friends, loved ones, all these things count on the stress scoreboard. So if I'm looking at my stress scoreboard and way high on there on the top is the fact that I'm 57 years old and still trying to perform these magnificent athletic feats that I love to compete in sprinting and high jumping and stuff like that. So if I wanna be an athlete and perform and recover and I'm old, I want to prioritize those things. And that's where my, my stress mechanisms are uh, mostly directed to. And so with my diet, I do not want to layer on further stress onto an already stressful life. And so that was kind of the awakening that yeah. fasting itself is stressful. Not to say that it doesn't have all those wonderful benefits that I myself have written about with Mark Sisson for many years, same with keto, but we kind of have to take a couple steps back, I think, in a, in a lot of cases to, to reflect on how can I get healthier, more active, more energetic. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about this. Cause you know, I'm on board with this. I've got my short-term keto book and I went through this as well. I always say, I'm grateful that I did my keto phase. There were a lot of really cool metabolic adaptations that I, you know, still to this day reap the benefit from. Mm -hmm. And I, 
I still intermittent fast, but I don't, I'm not like psycho about it. If it doesn't flow one day, especially earlier in the day, I'm, you know, happy to eat, but other days I just wait till I get good and hungry. So I'm a huge fan of this approach and found very similar uh, results after doing keto, bringing carbs back in. I mean, it was just like body comp energy, just enjoyment of food and just, you know, not ever feeling like I was lacking, um, and athletic performance, everything just went up. I'm curious from your perspective. So let's say somebody's listening to this and they're, you know, obese, definitely obese. And they're hearing you say, well, Hey, I have a lot of life stress though. I hate my job. Mm -hmm. I'm unhappy in my marriage. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of unhappy right now. Where would you say that person, what would be the path in terms of, you know, hearing, well, I don't want to add more stress in my diet. You know, what would you say to a person like that? Uh, the problem is with cellular energy production in the body. That's why we have this obesity crisis. And this problem is driven largely by consuming processed foods. So if we all want to take 10 steps back for a moment, and I'm honoring the great leaders like Dr. Robert Lustig, one of the world's leading anti-sugar crusaders, best-selling author of books like Hacking of the American Mind and recently Metabolical. He contends that if you simply eliminate processed foods from your diet, you cannot get fat. You cannot become obese or develop metabolic syndrome and all these disease patterns. And if you think about it, it's like, uh, how many times raise your hand if you've eaten too many omelets and you feel terrible and stuff, <laughs> or you had four steaks instead of three. It's really difficult to overeat to the point of adding a bunch of body fat if you're choosing exclusively wholesome natural foods. And so now we realize that any departure from the unfettered access to processed foods and indulgent foods in the standard American diet is going to be a gigantic win. And so therefore, all these books on the shelf about keto, about fasting, about whatever it is, vegan plant-based 30-day cleanse with blueberries and lentil soup, all those things are going to be huge successes because they're going to prompt like let's say a natural decrease in caloric intake because you're only eating during a specific window or whatever it is, or you're eliminating certain foods. And so if that's the starting point where it's like, look, we all have to agree, get rid of these processed foods. Um, do it cold turkey, do it with e extreme discipline and devotion. I hear people say, hey, everything in moderation, that's what really works, come on. It's like, no, it's not true because we're bombarded with messaging and products that are slowly but surely killing us. So if that's the starting point of the conversation, everything else is downstream. And what do you think about moving your fasting window up four hours? Is that good? Is that bad? Let's first talk about the Oreo cookies and the Ben and Jerry's that went down your throat uh, in the past seven days before we mix with this nuance and this uh, this folly really until our, our diets are cleaned up. And um, like yeah. I mentioned in that post, if you can start to bring in uh, more nutritious foods uh, and you know in increase your satiety and, and give your body things that it needs to operate optimally, you may very well find yourself burning calories better, burning fat better by virtue of, let's say for argument's sake, adding more fruit to your diet. And that's going to take you away from whatever you did the previous night because you were fasting for so long. And then you hit the potato chips, you defaulted into processed food. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm hearing from you, like your, the diet that you're currently eating, that's leading you into a place of obesity is more stressful than any approach, any, any whole food, natural, nutritious approach. You're more stressed out than that. So whether you're going to do keto or you're going to do a vegan, or you're going to do any of the, you know, intermittent fasting, getting your cellular energy up through giving yourself the nutrients that you need and getting rid of all the garbage is going to be less of a stressor on your body than all the crap it's trying to deal with right now. Yeah, yeah. well said. And, so and it's, yeah. Caloric it. overconsumption. I love this. I mean, this is my jam. This is like, this is how I live. This is what I'm always trying to teach. It's so easy to overeat calories, even if you're eating quote unquote healthy healthy processed foods, mm -hmm. it makes it really easy. I mean, I, I'm, I, I, I'm guilty. I do eat, you know, my, my CSA foods chips sometimes, but I'm, I'm mindful. I'm mindful. Cause I'm like, I could eat two bags of those easy, right. Even though they're avocado oil and they're grain free and all these things, 
they're very calorically dense because they're stripped of fiber. They have no protein. So I'm like, okay, let me dip these in some cottage cheese and let me have some Mm. fruit and veggies with this. Let me, you know, get some protein and fiber mixed into this. So, so in terms of like eating that lifestyle, you, you know, it's, you're saying eat more, eat more and move more. Right. And so there's some caveats I'm hearing from you. One is it's gotta be real food. If you eat real unprocessed foods, you're going to be able to eat more. And I, I have found that so true in my coaching. It's like, people are like, I can't eat this much protein. I'm like, oh, oh, cause it feel, cause it's filling you up. Cause it's filling you up. But I guarantee you, you used to eat more calories than that in terms of processed fats and carbs paired together. So I'm hearing nutrition, nutrient dense foods. And I'm hearing from you, it kind of really doesn't matter what those are. Is that do you have caveats um, on the composition of those nutrient dense yeah, foods? Good question. There's a few good questions in there. And um, I guess you can put in a big vote for personal preference here. Yeah. Uh, but again, all this obsession with like, which macros work better for me? And I found it this and that, and um, that's all great. And that personal optimization journey is, you know, never ending and yeah. being open and willing to think critically. Um, but again, it's like um, this this concept of, eating more and moving more is kind of cute because we realize that we have to bring in other elements into the picture here. So um, if you're not sleeping well, you're going to have a problem with cellular energy production, and that's going to prompt you to overconsume nutrient deficient processed foods to get that pickup that you need at 10 a.m. because your lifestyle is all messed up. Same with chronic stressors of any kind, like uh, arguing in stressful work environments, right? Um, over exercising. So I imagine a lot of your listeners are over a few of those first humps, like their house is not filled with junk foods and bottles of vegetable oils that are a year old or whatever. And so let's say you've done a lot of hard work to clean up your diet. You're out there exercising. Maybe you're even into fitness and have a nice devotion to all those things. That's when we really have to have an important conversation and say, look, and especially females, by the way, because they have different biological drives and their their primary biological drive is reproductive fitness. So females don't like to get six packs. I'm sorry. It's just the way it goes. And so if you're working out hard, and playing around with uh, things that have to be categorized as stressors, then you put yourself at really high risk of exhaustion, depletion, yeah. breakdown, burnout, illness, and injury. There's a great quote from uh, Dr. Herman Ponser, uh, reproduction, repair, growth, and locomotion are a zero sum game. In other words, if you borrow from one, and locomotion means all forms of exercise, movement, working out, jogging, hitting the weights. So if you're heavily locomotive and you're not giving yourself enough nourishment, you're going to turn these dials down like your reproductive fitness, like your repair and growth cycle. So you're going to be having a harder time recovering. Your immune system is going to take a bump down and you're going to get more uh, illness and so forth. And the most extreme example is in the elite female endurance or strength community, we have the loss of menstruation, amenorrhea. So the reproductive fitness dial goes down with the switch turning off because they're working out so hard. And that is nowhere aligned with health. And now it's even discovered, there was a great article about the Olympic runner, Elise Cranny, who uh, suffered from this uh, energy deficiency syndrome. There's an acronym. And so, you know, she was trying to get a little bit leaner to make the Olympic team to perform at these high levels and completely fell apart and realized that um, more nourishment, more nutrition, better training, she's going to end up with a better physique and a better performance anyway. And I think we've been socialized to be badasses in so many ways and, you know, to stay away from those nasty extra calories and all that thing. And so there's a certain portion of the population that are so far locked in yeah. that it's causing some real problems. And we all can name names and, and reference these people that have worked so hard and tried so hard and just aren't getting the results because uh, ex- excessive stress overall. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. And I, I mean, I can testify as a woman who maintains, you know, somewhat leanness all the time without, I would say a lot of effort. And I'm not saying that to be annoying. I'm saying that to share if everything got easier for me when I just started eating such a tidy, mm. real food, going to bed earlier, getting my nighttime routine on lock, not going for an extra walk at night or on the stair mill and trying to get that, you know, let me burn off everything I ate at dinner mode and just 
eating satiety, cutting off my eating window earlier so that I can have better circadian rhythm, not so that I can be skinny, right? I just want my body to be able to repair while I'm sleeping and just relaxing, just having Mm -hmm. boundaries saying no. So go into the gym in the morning. Yes, I definitely do that. That is playtime for me. That is fun. I get the stimulus. I get out. I walk, I do walk and I lift and then I'm done. And, you know, I have boundaries around my work schedule. I say Mm -hmm. no to people. I delegate. I ask my kids for help, you know? And so those patterns have led into this beautiful flow that you're talking about. And I have seen it time and time again. I was that woman. I was running full marathons, the Zumba classes, the little workout weights classes, every class I could get. I just wanted that heart pumping and everything was harder. Everything Mm. was harder. So you're right. For women, honestly, you're, you're nailing it on the head. If they can focus on their reproductive fitness, I love that term and being more in calm, get the stimulus, Mm. go, go bad a mode for a minute, Mm -hmm. right? Get the, get that. And then recover hard, eat nutritious food. It, the whole game, sleep, manage stress. It, that's when your body's like, okay, okay. It's safe to have a metabolism here. We're good. And on top of this whole conversation, I keep thinking about the depletion of our soils Mm. with our nutrients, right? So think about that. If you're, if, even if you're eating well, but you're starving yourself, you're barely getting any calories in, you know, you're the likelihood of you having the nutrients that you need to be able to have a thriving body and thriving health are very low, you know? So it's like, we need to be, create a, a space by being a baddie, getting yeah. in there, getting our baddie on, you know, and, and being able to eat more without getting fat so that we can get into that beautiful flow and get the nutrients we need to thrive. Um, yeah. I think the baddies sometimes take these hall passes out and go and consume junk food. And right. so if you're over exercising or exercising strenuously and not quite nourishing optimally, you're going to suck at cellular energy production, just like the obese, uh, metabolically ill person. And that's where you get these crash and burns episodes and not being able to sustain energy focus mood throughout the day. These are all symptoms that things are off in the body. And there's a lot of ways to arrive at that uh, destination that are, you know, easily turned around. We're not talking about more suffering and more struggling and more deprivation here, which, right. you know, have they, they've served their purpose. And I think that was what my post was about. It's like, now it's time to discard and rethink some of these things that might've worked really well for you. Mm-hmm. Um, look at you, your incredible success story. You had um, a, a lot of extra body weight back in the day. And so whatever it took to get to extricate yourself from those adverse lifestyle practices, and maybe it was Tara's extreme rigid uh, fasting until 1 p.m. every day or counting her, her macros and measuring your blood ketones and all that. And now that you've broken free from that, uh, that prison of, of the old days, um, now it's time to go for optimization. And I also like to um, have, have us all thinking at all times about there's the difference between what's possible for the human and what's optimal. And I'm in the ancestral health scene. I love it. I've written about it, total immersion into it. And we often romanticize this example of our ancestors and say, well, our ancestors didn't eat fruit in the winter time and neither should we because we're metabolically different and the long, dark, cold winters of minimal activity and minimal calories, that's when our body is better at storing fat. And so we shouldn't put any sugar into the body during winter. And I have a sticky note on my on my door that's been there for a long time with that quote from a, a, a leading expert. And so I'm like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Don't eat fruit in the winter. We didn't have berries back in, in, in caveman times. Now, wait a second. Um, what effing winter are you talking about today? Because last winter, Southwest Airlines had a promo $80 tickets to Hawaii from the West Coast. So we went to Hawaii four times during the winter and I had hot, sweaty hikes and tropical fruit at the finish, you know, and we're working out in well-lit gyms and, and you know, doing our, our routines throughout the winter and going into artificially lit homes with a mm. thermostat set at 71 or 73. Wow. So there is no winter today. And so we wow. don't need to reference our ancestral example because it doesn't make sense and there's no relevance whatsoever. Ooh, wow. Well said. What yeah, the environment. yeah, I love the it. Title of this podcast is What F and Winter. Yeah. yeah, I love that. It's it's so true. It's a true. The environment is different. We're not hunkering down, you know, <laughs> in some freezing cold house, not moving. We're not doing that. I hope you're not doing yeah. that. I hope you're moving in the winter. Yeah. You know, so well said. That is a great yeah. point. You and know, and not I to, you know, not to throw 
the whole thing out. It's, but we do want to adapt uh, yeah. some of the lifestyle principles that worked for our ancestors. So perhaps there's a time of year where you might want to tone down your training, um, tone down your activity, right. try to keep uh, the lights, you know, mellow in the final hours before bed, especially in the winter. And all that stuff's great. Same with cold plunging. Like, um, we don't need to do that today uh, because we have hot showers. Uh, but since we have no temperature stress whatsoever anymore, in most cases, we spend 93% of our time indoors, 86% indoors and 7% in a vehicle, uh, generally in, in Western world, um, then jumping in the cold tub makes sense because uh, it's kind of fun, it's short, and it gives you that brief stressor that can lead to net adaptive positive benefits. But I'm not going in the cold tub four times a day for, for 20 minutes. I mean, right. that's kind of the example. Yeah, I love that. You know, I think about this a lot because we both, I love ancestral health too. I love looking at, okay, what did nature provide for human beings, you know, and how was that intelligently managed like cold, cold immersion? I'm like, yup, I would be exposed to temperature extremes if, if I lived in nature more. So mimicking that, but I, you know, I do think personally, my personal opinion is we do get a little too caught up in this um, messaging that what humans used to do was better. And I think that's what we're talking about optimal. Cause I, I mean, I looked into the Inuit things that comes up a lot in the keto carnivore world. And I'm like the average life expectancy of an Inuit person was on one, on one data set was 60 years and one was 70, right? So 60 to 70 years. And obviously there's environmental factors. There's a whole bunch of factors, but the other thing is I'm not living in that. I don't, I don't, I'm not living in that environment, you know? Right. And so like, why are we glorifying past previous civilizations that maybe weren't as healthy as we are and have the opportunities in the environment that we have. So that's just kind of my opinion. And I honestly, like for me, it all goes back to being in tune with your body and having a relationship with your body. You talked about preferences with food, you know, and you talked about how you're not even wanting treats anymore. And I kind of, I wanted to hit on that with you for a minute, because that's what I found when I was keto, even though I'm grateful for the metabolic upgrades. I mean, my brain really did feel like a superhuman. I definitely got into a space where I can go long periods of time without eating and feel totally good on my energy mm -hmm. levels and things like that. I'm only responding to biological hunger. Grateful for, grateful for all that. On the flip side, on the flip side, I was jonesing. I was jonesing for a lot of stuff when I was keto. You know, I'd get done with a meal and I just had this itch. I was just like, I just need something else. And I, the whole time I kept thinking, if I could just take down like a pound of strawberries right now, which by the way, <laughs> 150 calories and chalk full of nutrients, you know, the little one pound package, that's 150 calories and super nutrient dense. And I'm like, if I could just pick on some strawberries right now, I'd be good. But that's not what was happening. What was happening was I was getting into the nut butters. I was getting into all the little mm. keto cookies and treats and, you know, this huge, yes. And so I was eating this huge calorie surplus and I still didn't feel satisfied mm. at the end of that. And so finally, when I had had enough, you know, and this was in the peak of the key, this is in 20 end of 2017, right? So pretty peak in the keto world. I was like, you know what? I I'm just, I'm going to go back to what I did before. And, you know, you mentioned that before, but really when I lost weight, it was a bodybuilder approach. And I actually didn't really track calories for that long. I just learned about protein fiber, you know, the, mm. the caloric density of carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, and kind of maneuvered that myself. And I got very lean and strong without tracking food. Um, and so for me going back into this approach where I could be happy and I could be in tune. I was like, my body, I remember sometimes being like, can I just have a freaking apple? Like, <laughs> I, I am like literally like sub, you know, sub 20% body fat woman who trains hard and runs like this is not making sense to me anymore. Why I can't just have an apple, you know, and my body, I am drawn to those things. I am definitely drawn to carbohydrates way more than fatty foods. And as I started to lean into that, the satiety an enjoyment aspect of food became so much higher mm. that I went from, I had gone from 11% before keto body fat to 18% on keto, and then dropping back to, into my regular, the way I like to eat, uh, leaner proteins, veggies, fruits, less fat. 
I dropped back down to 12.8% without even tracking anything. Just my energy levels went up. My satiety went up. My athletic performance went up. And, you know, and I love to share that. That's why I wrote the book. Cause I'm like, Hey, mm. keto is cool. <laughs> and it's changed a lot of people's lives. Like a lot. It is a powerful tool for the right person. But after a time getting happy with the food that you eat, I, I mm. wanted to hear about that with you, the mental, emotional side of eating when you started eating more fruits and bringing some of these foods back into your life. What was that like? Yeah, I may not be the, the best person to ask because I um, I've always made sure that I enjoy the heck out of my diet. But it was really interesting to note like the brain programming that's sort of out of my hands. And so uh, when Paul Saladino first spoke uh, that I first heard in 2019 saying, hey, you don't need these plants. They're not really that nutritious and they might possibly be causing you harm. And I'm like, wow, this makes a lot of sense. So I um, definitely embrace that animal based eating uh, mm -hmm. strategy where you're getting the most nutrition from the animal-based foods. That's indisputable to, to, to most people. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I started to think about it more. And then I'd sit down for my daily salad and look at it. And my brain was now uh, confused thinking, I don't even need this. This might not even be doing me a solid. Same with my giant piles of stir fry vegetables that I'd buy from the store and get these big, you know, bushels of uh, a spinach and kale and fry them up and make these wonderful preparations in the name of health. And now all of a sudden I'm, I'm calling the health benefits into question and I completely lost my appetite. I have not eaten a bite of salad since early 2019. And this used to be my centerpiece meal of my life. It tasted so good. I loved it. I was an expert at making it with all the wonderful things on it and drizzling the oil on and the nuts and the seeds and the, the, the wonderful, colorful plants. And so I realized that like this was out of my control when I look at that stock of broccoli and go, no thanks, even though my whole life I've loved to have a nice, delicious stock of broccoli with my meal. And so uh, similarly, um, one of my favorite indulgences over my whole lifetime has been ice cream, especially the wonderful handmade stuff that you can get on the streets of Seattle. And uh, every time we go there every year, we stand in line like everybody else and get these exotic flavors. And I just did that recently. And every single bite going down, I was like, you know what? I'm not feeling this anymore. It's not this incredibly decadent pleasure that it has been in the past. And part of it's dehabituating away from a sweet tooth because now all of a sudden I'm blasting something sweet and I can't handle it. So I think that we owe it to ourselves to, let's say, pursue optimal health as our first goal with our diet and then kind of build a winning diet around that goal rather than um, trying to dance around and always be pursuing uh, pleasure and indulgence. And even when we get you know deep into the scene and all these cookbooks that are on our shelves and we want to do another creative recipe and another creative keto snack with uh, the little balls of energy filled with all these different interesting tastes, um, some of that can be toned down just in the name of, you know, going through life, feeding yourself that, that what you need and still enjoying the heck out of it. So, um, you know, I love dark chocolate. That's my indulgence. I don't have many others or really hardly any others. I don't even call it an indulgence. Like it's a very nutritious food. And so I, you know, I, I can find pleasure in my diet to, to the high level without uh, needing to entertain myself all the time. So you still have not been eating vegetables on this. Um, I, I mean, I, I will do it uh, honestly to be polite in, in certain circumstances yeah. or in pursuit of, you know, culinary experience, like going to a nice restaurant and there's a, there's a preparation. I have no problem right. eating it. And uh -huh. I'm not a gut sensitive person where my mm -hmm. life has been saved by turning over to animal base, but I definitely feel for those people that have struggled and suffered yeah. all the time. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, um, it's sort of like, uh, Brian Sanders, Peak Human Podcast, he has a scoring system for food. It's pretty simple, people. Ready? Get your pen and pencil out or just remember it. Minus one is processed foods, right? It's a minus. You're eating a minus. Uh, he calls vegetables a zero and he calls the nutritious, wholesome, animal-based foods a plus one. And I would put fruit on there too. So uh, obviously I'm on that kick where um, you know, fruit is one of the most nutrient dense foods on earth and it's easy to digest, which contrasts to the vegetable community where there's a lot of problems, concerns, necessary preparation, soak, sprout, ferment, cook, all these things that we do in order to put vegetables into our diet. And speaking of the ancestral example, 
these are things that are interesting to reflect about now that the berry bush was sitting there for the the human throughout eons to pick and enjoy whereby um you know <laughs> gluten and making a loaf of bread is a whole different story interesting i i love brian i know brian well and i you know um for me i just so i just returned brad from interviewing at a regenerative farm out in ohio farmer jones farm uh, it's called the chef's garden they only pro, they only provided to chefs for the last 30 years super high end chefs they're kind of legends in that wow. world i was interviewing one of the brothers and the other brother was on rachel ray out in italy you know and so they are very well known in the cooking world um during covid they opened up their farm to people to, with a delivery system because all the restaurants were closed. Right. So um, it's kind of this like secret that has come out. And so I went out to the farm and, you know, what was really interesting is to look, they have a re on site research facility where they're testing the nutrient density of their vegetables compared to the USC av USDA average. And what's incredible to see, you know, I, I, they, it was so wonderful. Their scientists made a presentation for me and I'm looking at these charts and, you know, one was Napa cabbage. They've used their Napa cabbage, Napa cabbage from the store. And it was just like the one from the store, if I'm remembering the right vegetable, it had no selenium, right? Zero. And theirs was way above what is the recommended USDA recommended level. And, and so all, every single one of their mineral, mineral contents, they were all higher, significantly higher, you know? And so part of me, I left that, I just left that on Saturday, you know, a few days before we recorded this. And I, I just was thinking, no wonder so many people aren't liking vegetables. When I was tasting their vegetables, mm. I was like, it made me sad. It actually made me sad. You know, they left me a plate of these beautiful heirloom tomatoes. I have zero sensitivities to any of these foods. Right. And I, you know, normally don't eat late at night, but I got to this little, this little plate, you know, they put me up in their little chef's quarters and I like, I, I was joking on Instagram that I binge ate, I binge ate these tomato. I mean, they, I, they had salt for me and normally I love salt on my tomatoes. I didn't need any salt. I didn't mm -hmm. want any salt. It would have been ridiculous because they already, you know, the sodium content of their plants is much higher. So the flavor is more high. And they, this all happened because they were trying to make the highest quality tasting vegetables for chefs and nutrients came along with it. And so, you know, for me, I am, I'm not an anti-veggie person, you know, and I have a, I have a genetic mutation that causes me to hold on to estrogen longer mm. than my grandma died when she was my age of breast cancer. And so, you know, I look at cruciferous vegetables and how they help you metabolize estrogens. And mm. I feel amazing when I eat them. I love them. I love veggies. I love veggies. And I wonder, part of me wonders if the reason there's been such an anti-veggie movement that's kind of happened is because we've lost the nutrient density, mm. we've lost the flavor, you know, and it's not where it could be naturally. So that's why I'm such a fan of regenerative, but just throwing that out there. Cause I, you know, while obviously, I mean, I have two clients on carnivore right now because they have SIBO and I have found that to be a really powerful, effective intervention for SIBO. But, you know, once that's in place, you know, I think if we search out the highest nutrient dense vegetables, I, I definitely think they have a seat at the table, um, unless there's some sort of specific health concern and then fruit the same way, you know, and if I feel like if you listen to your body intuitively on this, you let go of all the programming and all the stuff, <laughs> right? We've, there's so much. And it's just, does that actually sound good to me today? You know, do, mm. and it's because some days I'm like, no, an apple sounds, I, I literally don't want that, you know? And, and as we learn to flow to me, that has created such a wonderful flow in my body. So I love hearing you kind of experiment, and I'm still not clear what instigated this. What, why, why, why did you, you just being you, you're just experimenting. Was there a particular did yeah, I miss I'd say that? I give credit to Jay Feldman Energy Balance Podcast because okay. he does a great okay. job and he has a succession of shows okay. if people want to hit that channel and listen to the first seven oh. shows or something. Okay, and I'm so like, exactly. I'll give it a try. And I listen to one, two, Got three, it. four. Um, but there's a lot of people that have been uh, kind of uh, hitting this issue over time. Dr. Tommy Wood, one of my favorites and one of the most sensible and brightest stars in the ancestral health scene. He told me a long time ago, because he was doing a personal consultation, which might not relate to everybody, especially if they have metabolic damage right now and they're dealing with other issues. But he said, look, um, as a healthy, active person, uh, I counsel people like you to eat as much nutritious food as possible. Yeah. until you add a pound of body fat and wow. then dial it back a bit. And that's where you know that you're optimal. So it kind of flips this script to this idea that's been 
prominently presented that if we can get more caloric efficiency and get by on fewer calories, that's going to promote longevity like it does in the rat studies. And yeah. I've heard some great takedowns where, you know, all rat studies are are, are done with uh, rat chow, which is crap. It's got uh, yeah. vegetable seed oils in there. So you're testing rats eating less shit food or more shit food. And the right. ones that eat less of the shit food at a, 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 a smaller uh, daily window, they live longer. <laughs> and it doesn't really have great much point. to do with this mm. optimal human. So there's a lot of things that are possible for the human, like fasting and being, you know, eating one meal a day for the rest of your life. And people are saying it's working for me. That's great. But then we have to ask ourselves what's optimal. And Tommy has a great quote that's going to relate, uh, especially you and I will appreciate. Um, today's elite performing athlete, this is citing research that today's elite performing athlete uh, generates six times more caloric energy expenditure than the busiest hunter gatherer in the history of. Wow. Human. And so Matthew Frazier, CrossFit or Christian Blumenfeld, the greatest triathlete, uh, the Tour de France participant is burning so much more energy and so much fitter than anything from our ancestral past wow. that these are not really relatable because mm -hmm. uh, as the, the great work of Marshall Salins, the anthropologist who came up with the um, the original affluent society called the hunter-gatherers, uh, it was also observed and is observed today that hunter-gatherers do the absolute bare minimum necessary to survive. They yeah. do not pick up a, a weight with a number on it and lift it up and down, <laughs> nor do they jog uh, to get uh, you know more training in for their next uh, persistence hunt. And so um, there's a lot of things to model and there's a lot of things to say, hey, we've advanced so far in society that now I can pursue athletic goals like performing in triathlon or speed golf or sprinting and high jumping, but it has nothing to do with the ancestral experience of barely trying to survive and that's where you get this right. um, justification perhaps for optimizing your diet year round and so forth in the example yeah. of fruit and, and many other examples like that like hey i take a protein a giant protein smoothie every morning too do you need a uh, whey protein when you can get all your protein from diet no absolutely not you don't but it's a convenient way and an easy digestible way to right. increase my protein consumption because i want to be on the high end rather than dabble on turning down some of those dials that I mentioned. Brad, I love this so much because what you're doing is in my opinion, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to compare this to being a mom. One thing I have <laughs> learned from being a mom is my, is how to honor the, the generations that are coming behind me because they are wise and they are smart. And I tell my kids all the time, I'm like, you're another generation more evolved than me. Right. Mm. So I, your DNA is one generation more evolved. You got a whole other side coming in compared to me. So I, I respect and honor, they truly have wisdom. And if we honor that we gain more wisdom and our ancestors, my parents, they have wisdom, right? And what I feel like you're doing here is a similar approach in terms of looking at health. It's like, let's honor all these things that we've learned from our ancestors and let's look at nature and, 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 and keep all of that in mind and honor mm -hmm. that. And let's also see that we are evolving. We are evolving. So we don't want to stop there. We don't want to only do what they did. We want to also evolve as human beings and take all these resources that we have available to us now and show what's possible. So I love it. I love it. Fantastic. Okay, the, yeah. the last thing I got to ask is the recovery, the injury stuff. So what happened there? You said you were recovering better. You know, you had some nagging injuries and they got better. You know, what, what, what do you chalk that up to? Can you talk about that? Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of reflections going on about how to do this stuff right. And I have so much competitive intensity and ambition and I've been a lifelong athlete and all that stuff's wonderful. But these uh, attributes can also turn out to be um, your enemy, your weakness, and so I've really tried hard to learn how to uh, fly under the radar more with my enthusiastic workouts. And this means working within my capacity so that let's say it still might be an impressive session and you, you get some good work done, but you're not laying it all out there like we've been socialized to think is important or laudable. And I, I see this happening like 
uh, in a CrossFit workout where everyone's gathering around and screaming and cheering, and you're going to do more and more and more. And once in a while, those personal breakthroughs are wonderful to experience, usually in a competitive setting. So if it's like, if it's competition day, that's great. You see what you're made of and, and go to the limit. But generally speaking, in training, we have to be, uh, we have to follow a kinder, gentler approach. And by doing so, we are honoring the example set by the elite athletes anyway. And so the movies have screwed up this image of the, the top athlete going and going and working hard and puking on the side of the track. But in reality, um, the, the world's elite athletes in, in all the major sports are so well conditioned that they are training well within their capabilities at all times. And that allows them to build and build and build without interruption from illness, injury, and the things that recreational athletes face all the time to, to an extreme. And so one example was like uh, muscle soreness after a workout. Yeah, that's that means I'm getting bigger. Uh, that means I did a great job. I was so sore the next day. It was such a killer session. It was so awesome. Um, muscle soreness after workout should be a rare occurrence that comes in when you do something new and different or, or whatever. You're you're going to have soreness when you're you're trying to get fitter over time. But if you have recurring muscle soreness after workouts, that means you're doing too much and you're bot you're going beyond your capability. You're digging into the well, and then you're requiring more recovery time and uh, you know regression and fitness rather than a constant, steady, consistent forward progression. Yeah, that's what I always tell people. They're like, I'm so sore, I can't walk, and I'm like, okay, well you did a good job. Like you, you really <laughs> nailed it. And next time you don't have to nail it that hard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, you know, so I totally agree. And it's all, it's, it's, it's all about, to me, it's all about small doses of stressors mm. and recovery. It's like mm -hmm. just enough of a stressor that I need recovery. And that's it. You know, I always say, get the stimulus and get out. That's it. You know, and just like fasting, you know, you could talk about one mm. meal a day. I mean, I was so deep in this. I was doing 36 hour fast, at least once a month, you know, intermittent fasting, like crazy, just experimenting a lot. And yeah. even with one meal a day, I did that during COVID because I wasn't in the gym. So my appetite dropped dramatically. So I almost just kind of fell into it. And, and then I started pushing it a little, I'm like, Oh, I'll try OMAD and see how this goes. I lost 17 pounds during COVID wow. walking and doing OMAD and I'm not like overweight. So that was significant for me. Wow. Um, and I was, I was experimenting. There were times that I was like, okay, just go to bed. Cause I was hungry for sure. You know, mm. but I lost my period. That is the only time I have been 10% body fat doing a bikini competition. And I didn't lose my period. And I got all screwed up from OMAD, you know, just, it was just, it came like a week and a half again, you know, I, I was just having irregular irregularity and I totally backed off of that approach. I'm like, I'm not going to tell women about that. It's too much. It's too much of a stressor, at least for me. And I feel like my body is extremely resilient. So I was like, mm. this is happening to me. Like, I'm, I, you know, I don't know if I recommend that one for women, right. Cause it's just, it's, it's when we want to go into this mindset of like, go hard or go home, you know, just like what you're talking about, the overtraining, the starvation, the, you know, no carbs ever for the rest of my <laughs> life. Like, you know, there's super extreme approaches. I don't know why we like those. I think our ego likes it. It makes us feel like a baddie, you know, but too much for too long, too mm -hmm. much of any stressor, you can't recover optimally, you know? And so I guess that's kind of leads into what you were talking about your injury recovery. I would assume is like just having a more gentle approach with your body taking off the gas all the time, letting your body hyper recover with a bunch of food and mm -hmm. some rest. Is that kind of what you're talking it up to? For sure. Yeah. And interestingly, you know how it's always bantered about as a benefit that you're never hungry now because you're doing so well with keto or time restricted feeding or intermittent fasting. And it's, you know, it's widely believed that this is awesome right. because you're so fat adapted. And now I will report because my experiment is now uh, about five months duration here as I wrote on the post, like I'm, I'm now eating this big, huge bowl of fruit and making this huge smoothie and then going about my day and eating the same meals I might've done before. So, you know, more calories, more food. Now I get hungry much more frequently and I can't last as long. And mm -hmm. it's like, I'm not so sure this could be a good thing that I've turned on these hunger signals, uh, implying perhaps that all my dials are turned up to 10 my my reproductive my libido right my my uh my my growth and recovery my my performance and then mm -hmm. also what i'm capable of doing and being more active and more energetic because i'm fully fueled and 
uh, it's just something to to rethink yeah. because it's like yeah. the exact opposite of what we've always touted as this wonderful benefit. Guess what? I'm never hungry all day and I could fast for 24 or 36. No way I could do that now. And I'm probably less, uh, less adaptable just due to my habit patterns. Yeah. Yeah. I love, I, I love this. talk. I love that you're forging this, you know, I can't wait to see what, what you have to say about this a year from now, you know, and I love you're setting the example of self-experimentation and all these thoughts that come in is like, wait, maybe that's a good thing that I'm hungry more <laughs> often. You know, maybe I have yeah. my thyroid production is up. Maybe I have a faster metabolism. It's requiring more. I don't know. Let's find out. Are you doing blood yeah. labs by the way, during all this? Yeah. I have this operation called Merrick health. You're probably familiar with them. And it's so amazing what we have at our uh, fingertips these days in terms of uh, taking our own route, disengaging from the, yes. and this is not a criticism when I say the sick care system, love the sick care system, man, because some guy took out my burst appendix and saved my life. And he was right. a great surgeon and all the people in the hospital that cared for me. And then I waved goodbye to them. And I said, I'll see you in 72 years when I'm 112 <laughs> or whenever I next need a hospital. Uh, yeah. But, you know, disengaging and going for optimization rather than normal. And yeah. so I did all the blood work and then you get a one-on-one -on -one consultation and they're looking at your numbers going, uh, yeah, it's, it's way in the normal range but we want to see you at optimal. And yeah. that is like, uh, I may put a big smile on my face, especially with testosterone. Cause I, I write about that on occasion. I'm working on a book and uh, on mm -hmm. one post I put on Instagram, you know, I had my highest level of a thousand and six serum testosterone, which is like off the charts, even for a young person. And I'm typing up this, uh, you know, this, wow. this glowing post, like, Hey, this is 95 percentile, even for guys in their twenties. And then I finish, yeah. and I'm like sitting back going, wait a second. I'm being compared to the most pathetic population in the history of the planet. And so if you want to be normal with your testosterone levels, you are riding on a sinking ship. The research shows that the average male testosterone level is declining at a rate of 1% per year since the 1980s for decades. So like grandpa, when he was my age, had... 40% more testosterone and, and all the, the previous generations, because now we have plastic drinking bottles and EMF Wi-Fi. And um, basically they adjusted the scale recently. You know, the global testosterone norm scale was, was moved down a bit. Uh, oh. And they attribute it to, you know, in the, in the research talking about why they attribute it to the global obesity ep epidemic. Cause if you yeah. have a spare tire um, you're, you're going to tank your male hormones. And so okay. Um, yeah, that, that blood work is really important because, um, again, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to die of anything. I, I go to the doctor once yeah. a year and get my checkup and they, they send me off with flying colors, but that's not what I'm about. And we got to right. go, we got to go deeper. And now we have resources so you can, you know, um, engage with someone who's right there thinking along your lines and it's wonderful, you know, go to the blood lab yourself. You don't have to navigate through a bunch of appointments. Yeah. Wow. How about you? You into that you stuff? Oh yeah. Big time, <laughs> big time. Junkie. I'm like, I, I, I lived the life of normal on average. It sucked. Yeah. I'm yeah. never going back to that yeah. place. And once you get out of that place, you're like, how good does this get? Yeah. I'm insatiable. It's just, I mean, I'm grateful for where I'm at, but it's all, I'm like, well, let's try this. Let's try that. You never know until you try something new. I'm curious. Do you mind sharing how old you are? 57. Yeah. You're 57 and your yeah. test is over a thousand. That's I, every guy who's hearing this is going to want, you said you're writing a book on yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm working on, working on a oh, book of doing oh a lot my. of research and I'm really interested in, um, natural strategies. Um, and I know people that are highly touting the testosterone replacement path and right. it's very interesting. And I respect them a lot. Mark Sisson's talked extensively about his success. Mark Bell, the power project, the power lifter um, and his great podcast. He's been on replacement therapy for 20 years. And mm -hmm. I think we have some flawed notions. Like we see the athletes who are doped up and the females setting the world records with their huge muscles. And so there's abusing, uh, you know, anabolic drugs, and then there's optimizing through careful medical intervention. So I'm trying to remain open-minded that someday yeah. I'm going to go knocking on that door, have my one-on-one -on -one consult and say, I'm doing everything I possibly can. And I'm seeing some slipping going on. Maybe I'll have yeah. to think about hormone replacement therapy, but yeah. it, it's, it's so 
obvious that if you're not doing absolutely everything you can with lifestyle, uh, you know, drug intervention is just going to be a disaster. There's a concept called aromatization where you convert extra testosterone into estrogen if you're an unhealthy person. So if you're going in for replacement therapy and you have a spare tire to begin with, um, you're very likely to aromatize the extra male hormone and get the the, the adverse conditions like uh, uh, gynecomastia, man cans, whatever they want to call it. So oh, I've seen it. Um, I've seen it time yeah, yeah. and time again. So I'm, you know, I'm getting a ton of sleep. I'm going for maximum nutrient density diet. Someone asked me the other day, like, what camp are you in now? And I said, you know, I'm in the maximum nutrient density diet camp. Yes. That's my main goal. I have a little chart on my website. Uh, called the carnivore scores food rankings chart and it has the tiered rankings of the most nutritious foods on the planet and then down one level down one level to help you kind of focus on what to emphasize Love um, it. but you know all those things are in place and then we'll you know we'll talk about how to be optimal for the rest of our lives and you know just like that classic throwaway line that our ancestors only lived to be 33 um we should be dead by now um there's a little bit of relevance there even though there's great research that certain hunter gatherers were able to live um 60 70 80 years in good health and there's this scientific concept called maximum observed lifespan that was presented by the true forefather of paleo and paleo diet boyd eaton who you know wrote a paper in 1988 talking about how to honor the ancestral diet. Um, So this maximum observed lifespan was seen 10,000 years ago at 94. That means humans were capable of living 94, 10,000 years ago, if they made it through all the the primitive misfortunes. Yeah, so pretty wild. Yeah, I feel like you are leading a movement, truly. I really do. It's like you're taking, you're taking from the, I feel like we've been in a little bit in starvation mentality. <laughs> like, how can I survival? What's kind of? possible? Like, how can I What's survive? possible? Yeah. How, you know, how can I survive? How little can I get away with? And you're like, let's go to thriving. Let's yeah, go Rob to thriving. Wolf. Like, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. You, and, he's and, your guy to uh, quote. This is his quote. If you want to live longer, lift more weights and eat more protein, end quote. That's that's big right there, you know? Yep. I mean- That's what I say um, all the time. Pretty simple. That's gonna yeah. beat the, uh, and you know, there's great fasting leaders that are presenting this great research and this great science, but I'm gonna go with Rob Wolf and his kick-ass yeah, jujitsu skills and his research, you know what I mean? Yes. And also um, there are very few examples in elite sport of any sport of athletes following restrictive diets, despite the propaganda documentaries that want to make you think that these plant-based guys are kicking ass. And a lot of that's a little bit distorted. And maybe there are some shining examples of individuals, but generally, and I know the athletes have a long way to go to optimize diet, and they could probably use your coaching in a lot of guys in the NFL or whatever that are still going for the chicken McNuggets. But generally speaking, they are attempting to fully fuel themselves, and they're not playing around at all with a 36-hour fast every every quarter or whatever. No, yeah. I was I was thinking about Rob. I was wondering if you've had some conversations with him because I remember Rob Wolf coming out at Metabolic Health Summit, I think in 2019, and just dropped a bomb. <laughs> like we were, you dropped know, it's a keto conference. And he's like, actually, I think the path to longevity is to eat more food and be anabolic more. And we're like, wait, what? <laughs> you know, that's classic Rob. He's just gonna come out and surprise everybody, you know. So he's been talking about this for some time now. And I love hearing you talk about it too. And you know, Obviously, it's it's good to go into AMPK. It's good to let your mm-hmm. body recover. You know, it's good to, in my opinion, this is where I stand now. It's good to let your body digest your food before you go to bed, so you can, re- you know, actually mm-hmm. prepare your body and things like that. But this mentality we've been in for so long of like starve, we're, you know, and I, I get it. We live in a world of food abundance, and there's so much processed food. It's like it's it's almost like a pendulum effect. But yeah. now it's like, oh, okay, but, but we don't have to be there if we can just choose the right kinds of foods and lift weights and thrive and, you know, be happy. So I, I love all yeah, of this. Talk. Well said. It reminds me of a, a, another clever quip from Jay Feldman, Energy Balance Podcast. He says, if you claim to feel better from skipping breakfast, we need to take a look at what shit you're eating for breakfast. 
right? Because if you go have a nutritious breakfast, arguably that might make you feel good and energetic and ready to go for the day. And uh, we talk about how fasting in the morning is great because you're, you, you have these uh, adaptive hormones that rise when you wake up the serotonin, the cortisol, and you should feel fine and alert when you wake up. But again, these are stress mechanisms and yeah. he's suggesting have a bowl of fruit to turn down those stress hormones a little bit, because guess what? You're going to need them because you have a one-on-one -on -one training session at 1115 where you're going to go throw around some weights. And I'm like, okay, I'm feeling all that. Like, I don't want to rely on my stress mechanisms all the time. Interesting field of thought. I still don't eat in the morning before I train. I think that from, from my perspective, currently I'm using those stress hormones as a performance boost in my workout. Uh -huh. Right. And I, you know, I have a system that I use in coaching called neurotyping from Christian Thibodeau up in oh, I Quebec. love that stuff. And I've listened to that guy. Yeah. I love that great. stuff. I, I tried to figure out which one I was the one, A, I'll, the one B. I'll, I'll, I'll send you cool. a link. I got, yeah, some, yeah. I'll, I'll, pay, I'll pay for your tests. I would love to see yours. Oh you my know? gosh. Yeah. But I, I, I am adrenaline dominant, right? So I yeah. perform better in workouts when my adrenaline is lit up. So I personally really like to ride that. Like it really, really is a hack for me, but I have other people that are not, especially the, my dopamine dominant people. They don't want to convert that dopamine into too much adrenaline. So having something to eat, before they work out is a performance hack. So it kind of depends in my opinion, you know, on, on the person on that one, you know, but um, anyway, Brad, this is super cool. Thank you so much for making the time to come on and talk about all this. So like, what's, what's new? you got the testosterone book, you know, where can people, wh where would you direct people? Oh and, gosh. If they want to listen to the B Rad podcast and having so much fun doing this, I'm so glad you're, you know, working the mic and, and working so hard to dispense the information. So it's a, it's a great community. And I think a great medium to, to get engaged. And my website, bradkerns.com has all kinds of fun things, including free downloads and uh, I mentioned a couple things. So yeah, I'd love to connect. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And I will vouch for your podcast. It's excellent. Every single episode is excellent. So go check out the B-Rad podcast. And Brad, thank you again.